Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Hi everybody, welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we gather to cohere and dialogue at the knife's edge of what matters most. And today is the third of a series that we're doing with Samo Berja. I think I have that right. <laughs> Called Live Players. So uh, we'll be doing a talk followed by a QA. and a And uh, with that, I hand it over to Samo. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me as always. And uh, yeah, look, the series, in, the series is entitled Live Players. And one of the more interesting things and the interesting implications is where would we actually go next in just a second? It's surprisingly warm day. So the question is, where would we go next? Were there live players who wanted to properly reform our institutions and reorganize our society? What might that look like? And I think that one of the very basic changes I think we should see at almost every level of society is to have uh, dominance of individuals rather than of systems. So the presence and the ability to express the actions of coherent minds rather than adhering to pro processes and protocols that were set into place not even that long ago. Chesterton's fence applies to a fence that's been there for 500 years. It does not apply to something that's been there for 50 years or for 20 years. A lot of the bureaucratic red tape we've become so used to is stuff that's only been developed in the last 20 or 50 years. A lot of the ideologies that propose that, you know, human individual action is unimportant or irrelevant or inappropriate or that unusual thinking or that, you know, uh, extraordinary changes in a person's life are unheard of. This seems like it's been there since time immemorial, but I actually think it is ratcheted up over the last 40 years, possibly starting as early as the middle of the 20th century, possibly later in like the 1970s. But I think, you know, I think 40 years is probably the best approximation. And I think it tracks fairly naturally a different statistic. You can map the distance that children are allowed to roam on their, on their own, unsupervised by parents from the home throughout the 20th century. You start with this vast radius of 20 miles. It shrinks to five miles. It shrinks to one mile. And today it's like 100 feet, right? So if you're a minor, you're a kid, you on average aren't allowed to go more than 100 feet from your home. I think we're approaching conditions of home arrest and home arrest together with school arrest means that these are you know, fully incarcerated human beings I think this shows up in the adults as well. I think the adults have less ability to roam. Now, perhaps they can, you know, hop on a plane. They can, well, at least they could until 2020. Uh, and they go very far in terms of miles, but they don't go very far in terms of cultures. You fly 4,000 miles, you visit Europe, you visit North Africa, Southeast Asia, and you never left a hotel, right? You're always there in the simulated experience of an identical culture. So I think the affordance to go into a different mode of living and come back from it to midstream mid switch careers and break the tracking pattern, I think that's become much harder now than 30, 40, or 50 years ago. I also think that there's strong evidence that this kind of narrowing effect is partially driven by the development of the panopticon. We're all building the panopticon together, right? It's not the case that we needed invasive, intrusive, sort of like heavy-handed government action. It's just that we freely gave the information to both the recommendation engines that enable consumerism and our general you know, pattern of consumerism. So we were very happy when Amazon read our information and gave us better and better recommendations. We're very happy when the search engine seems to work better. We don't really care if it tracks us and on the other hand, we want to project this image of the perfect, the ideal self, and we share this very aggressively. We, in fact, want all our friends to see when we're talked to a prominent person, when we eat delicious food, 
uh, when we are in beautiful nature or when we are traveling, you know, those 5,000 miles to that beautiful hotel on the other end of the world that might as well just be a Western hotel in a Western city. These are all part of this information cloud we've released. And this also means that not only are we socially observing each other all the time, forcing us to keep up appearances in this way, where previously in an urban environment, at least you could have retreated into anonymity. Here, I have to give a minor concession to you know, previous life where I think that private, pr privacy as such has always been a rare and luxury good enjoyed by the minority of the population. It's kind of an anomaly of the 19th and 20th century, or to be more generous, for large urban population centers, they have always been an anomaly where it was possible to maintain some privacy and some social anonymity, right? Allowing this kind of reinvention. However, the social technology of self reinvention, such as things such as a, a religious conversion or a, a festival, right? A festival like uh, where it's possible to have essentially opposite day, right? In medieval carnivals, people would make fun of the Pope, they would make fun of kings, they would make fun even of saints. How in the world was that possible if you're burning witches the rest of the year? Well, that massive release valve, right, that allowed a lot of the same experimentation, uh, much as I think the Amish call it Rumspringer, where they have this period where, you know, children are becoming adults, they've been raised in the Amish community, this very, you know, insular type of Christianity, uh, they have their own language, it's not English, I think it's called Platterdeutsch, I could be wrong here, I might be misremembering it, uh, Am Amish German, and they, of course, don't make use of certain technology. So this is a really big lifestyle change. And then there's a period where the kids are allowed to go out into the world that's not the Amish world and explore it and learn from it. So in this way, the, the Amish, I think, are not like supremely advanced. They're in some ways, you know, I mean, perhaps they're objectively advanced, but this is a throwback, right? There used to be more things like this. Can we imagine opposite day or a digital carnival? Like, I, I think we're way too uncomfortable for that. I think we feel much too precarious to make fun of our idols or imagine a day where Democrats are supposed to be Republicans and Republicans are supposed to be Democrats online. Like, I think people are too inflexible, both internally and interpersonally for that. So the narrowing range of the roaming of children is a symptom, though also a cause, right? but mostly a symptom of the narrowing range of risks we feel comfortable with because these are, again, not fundamentally physical risks. In terms of physical risks, even with the coronavirus pandemic, we are right now much, much physically safer than 100 years ago. But I think we feel and project onto these physical risks and we flee away from the physical risks because we've become hypersensitized, hypersensitized to the social risks and this kind of need for a particular kind of social approval and a very consistent life story that we can present not just bureaucratically, which is an ancient problem, right? You always need it. You know, here's the document that proves that I was conscripted already. You can't conscript me again. Here's the document that proves I paid my taxes. Here's the deed to my father's, you know, farm and so on. That kind of bureaucratic legibility, we, we've always had that or rather um, you know, we've had it for, let's say, 20,000 years or 10,000 years. I have a contrarian thesis that actually we've had writing uh, for much longer than it's usually acknowledged, right? Probably all the way to the end of the last ice age, <clears throat> all the way from the end of the last ice age. But let's just took, take the, the normal, you know, consensus history view of 10,000 years. So as long as we've had writing, we have had to impose bureaucratic legibility on organic lives. And now uh, we, don't, we also have a narrative compatibility where because there's this record that anyone can always mine for previous comments and pictures, we are socially stuck to be much more legible than even kind of the, the rural, the, the word of mouth history that a village might uh, engage with, right? Because again, social media mob and a village. They both might know you about equally well, or rather they can access the same amount of information, but you are far less powerless interfacing with the village. Now agreed, uh, a village can probably also just kill you. And for now, a social media mob cannot just kill you, but you have very little power 
over the social media mob compared to the individual relationships you could leverage in a village. In a village. So there's a social self-consistency enforcement. And then finally, there's like a national security uh, apparatus of significant weight that's been fully assembled and I think will just be deployed to different political purposes in the very near future. Okay, so a lot of topics, drop them all there. I proposed a few mechanisms. I'm happy to now double click on whatever part of that seemed the most interesting and uh, possibly if there are questions that stand out, I can answer them immediately. Great, so uh, if you would like to put a proposition or a question into the chat, I will then call your name and you can ask your question directly to Samo. And then uh, we're kind of gonna allow for an etiquette of a back and forth, but uh, one round of back and forth and then we'll go to the next person. So we already have some propositions and questions from, from Dan. Dan, would you like to unmute yourself? I guess I didn't, I didn't mean to be speaking actually. <laughs> I just was triggered by what I was hearing and making comments. Um, you mentioned something at some point about uh, the digital environment playing mm -hmm. a big role, you know, the, the development of digital technology and social media. At least for people under 25, I think it's a primary component of socialization. Um, arguably for people under 35, it already existed, but I think people between 35 and 25 grew up in a world where text-based pseudonyms were the main mode of interaction, right? You would post on forums, you would send e you know, emails, whatever, right? And you didn't necessarily use your own face as your avatar on a forum in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, and I'm thinking back to the mid 90s when I was one of the first people on the, on the internet um, it was completely text-based, you know, that, that was before any graphics were there. Um, okay. Uh, I, I can, I can see that to some level there, there, yes, there is some socialization there, but I would, I would, I would argue that independent of that as, mm -hmm. as a separate strain, even if we took that out, I think that there's been an increasing bureaucratization of organizations and a, an increasing clamping down by the elites in these institutions mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a, an increasing fear of the one who questions the ideology, even if only innocently questions the ideology. You know, not even aware of the danger of the question. Right, right. And of course, there's, there's, you know, a thousand points of doctrine that you might get wrong, right? Or even hidden or inexplicit doctrine. Um, so it's very easy to ask that, that accidental question. Um, I think that, I think that's right. Like I said, I opened with about 40 years now, we've seen this increasing escalation. So that predates the, digi the digital world. Um, and I think that partially comes out of, well, there are several competing explanations, right? I think there is Eric Weinstein's explanation of the embedded growth obligation, where he proposes that most of our institutions, be they universities or companies, or even, you know, ultimately governments, were predicated on perpetual growth. And in the absence of this growth, they cannot deliver on the implicit promises that they have. In the academic system, this shows up where most grad students, the, the graduate student was originally a program intending to prepare you for work in academia. The vast majority of grad students will never work in academia after they're done with their stint in grad school and after they've, you know, performed their task as cheap lab labor, essentially, or, uh, you know, assistance to the professor. And this is something he speaks about very eloquently. He wrote a paper on the topic. And he also talks about like the economics of knowledge work. I think that certainly contributes. A different story is the story of like ideological shift. Uh, you have a left-wing story and a right-wing story on this. The left-wing story is about the slow dominance of neoliberalism that hollows out all ideological alternatives, where things are exposed over and over again to the open market, where losses are socialized and profits are privatized. 
And then the right wing version of this story is the world where there's been a slow march through the institutions where over time, say critical theory has been over applied and has deconstructed the basic values of society in the absence of those values of those traditional modes of behavior. What you're stuck with is this very minor and very tight rule, uh, rule adhering process, right? Where you're trying to write all the rules for all the places where you might encounter harm, right? So a social conservative would say, argue that, you know, campus rape culture is a natural consequence of uh, sexual liberation on campus, or even uh, a more extreme conservative would just say, it's a consequence of having co-ed colleges, right? Um, so because they would take a pessimistic view on human nature. Now, again, these are like three stories now, and I can easily tell two more. Uh, two more stories I would like to tell, which I actually think uh, I feel capture this fairly well and are not necessarily incompatible with the Eric Weinstein story. I think it's very, I think it's very insightful in its own right. One is the succession problem, where I think the people currently running the set of elites, sorry, the, the current set of elites that's running the current institutions are possibly on the older end, baby boomer generation, a few might be silenced. Uh, a lot of them are, say, very older Gen X range, right? If you look at the average age of CEOs, it's around 50 years old. These aren't the people who built these institutions in the first place. So often they just lack a lot of the tacit knowledge needed to run this well. Uh, so the first story is one of outright succession failure, where there's a failure in skill succession. And the second one I would advance is that of a centralized declining empire. This is from Empire Theory. You can read about it in my document titled uh, Great Founder Theory. So a subset of Great Founder Theory is Empire Theory, mostly deals with power dynamics. And I think there's been, in a centralized declining empire, what happens is the center cannot produce novel resources or novel growth, thereby cannot redistribute surplus of growth, thereby only redistributes the resources that already are there, therefore necessarily comes into conflict. So the center, the high power in society comes into conflict with the middle layer of society because they are constantly expropriating the middle layer and giving back to different parts of the middle layer and sometimes use low as this kind of like countermeasure. Now, high, mid and low aren't like classes here in a, in a Marxist sense or in a classical class analysis sense. These are power classes in the sense that you might classify an organization or an individual as high, mid or, or low, right? So again, we're not here necessarily talking about individual identities. Um, so I think these two kind of go hand in hand. You have a succession failure that's then followed by an extractive mode of institutions that then, because their legitimacy still rests in this wildly growing era of the 1920s to 1960s. Uh, they have as a story of legitimacy, uh, this, this uh, growth narrative that's no longer there. I think like people you know, of the baby boomer generation, I think they believe that they would live to see the singularity. I mean, it's 2020, where's the singularity, right? A singularity would be a straightforward extrapolation of what growth should have brought had it continued from 1970 in a compounding way. Cool, very happy to, to go to the next question. I think I, uh, hopefully that was, was a solid answer. <laughs> great, thank you. So really great question from Anish. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Um, should I read the question out? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, give me a moment. Yeah. So one thing uh, that somewhat surprised me when I initially came to the US, you know, I mean, it wasn't immediate, but over time, I started to notice it um, was that there seems to be a pretty complete lack of what you'd call uh, Bacchanalian social uh, occasions that are just, you pointed this out, uh, like you said, you know, opposite day or that kind of reversal, right? I try, I try to bring closer what carnival used to be than rather what it is currently, right? People might associate carnival right now with Venetian carnival where, you know, it's masks or with Brazilian carnival, which is nudity. 
And in a funny way, like masks and nudity, well, I'm from San Francisco, that's just normal. <laughs> right, so it's not, right. so try to show how subversive Carnival actually was in, in a medieval context. Or possibly, you know, in, uh, what's, what, what is the term, uh, homoresis, I think, when you have an adverse thing, uh, an oh, adverse social, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, for example, small amounts of radiation are very good for the body because they seem to activate regenerative mechanisms in mm -hmm. the body. Yeah, similarly with autophagy and fasting and so exactly. on. Exactly. So perhaps even from a socially conservative perspective, uh, the carnival and you know festivals were actually extremely good things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I, I was surprised by the complete lack of, as I said, one somewhat bacchanalian social occasions. Um, and second, uh, the Dionysian aspect of um, culture among the people that I was sorted into. I mean, probably it might be an artifact of the group of people that I was sorted into thanks to the route that I took to come to the US, which is, you know, upper middle class professionals of the software type. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, but what surprised me was that the, the image that one has of the US when you're from outside is a significantly more liberated and less repressed place, as in less, mm -hmm. less everyday regulated, if that makes sense. Right. Um, and do you think this has to do with, like, like you said, people are extremely afraid. Do you think it has to do with the rejection of uh, what Chapman would call inherent nebulosity? As in, it seems a lot of these form the purpose of taking, you know, boundaries which might have been somewhat off, perhaps, and just acknowledging their nebulosity and sort of providing an avenue, like the carnivals or the other things of this kind, uh, renegotiating the fact that they are nebulous and that they might over slowly change over time. And so something like this could generate common knowledge about, um, oh, okay, turns out that yes, in fact, there has been some kind of a minor shift. Like, is that maybe a neurosis or just a... Hmm. I think it is, a, it, it is definitely a narrowing of cultural space. I think it's very difficult to settle on exactly the right ontology. While I greatly appreciate Chapman's writing, I feel the ultimate classification of belief systems, culture, and values is yet to be written. And if we listened to Hegel, we would also say it can never be written. As soon as you write it, you need to rewrite it and, you know, kind of self-author in this auto-poetic auto way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is a fragilization of communally accepted principles on which to judge conflict mediation, right? So conflict mediation and conflict management is a fact of the human condition. And I think there used to be a very rich vocabulary of many different principles you could invoke on what grounds should we judge this dispute and not even judge in a legal sense, just judge in a social sense. In fact, you know, no matter how tolerant we are, we again, we always stay judgmental kind of as human beings Again, maybe maybe my perspective as someone from San Francisco is a little biased here, where it's like maximum tolerance and maximum intolerance of a particular type go very well together. Um, but it seems to me that the vocabulary people can invoke or even agree on when it's appropriate to invoke has shrunk, which means uh, fewer possible outcomes, means conflict resolution less well suited. This means uh, ideological consensus has to be more rigid. Office politics has to be more rigid. So I almost would look for this in the micro dynamics of decision making situations, then radiating outward to something like the narrative rather than the narrative, you know, infecting or putting pressure on the micro environment of a particular office. Okay. I mean, my own experience in the Bay Area is that conflict resolution is almost completely broken down and it mm -hmm. generally turns into a jockeying for um, greater victim status and um, everything eventually just degenerates into this is probably abusive and that's the end of it. Um, so well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Nish. But we'll go for the next one now. Great. Thank you. And we'll have scroll up here to Shar. Would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, hi, Sama. Um, I wanted to ask, as we see globalization, well, I'm not sure we can call it, it's receding, but uh, as you see the Sinosphere 
increasing and maybe a multipolarity of the world. Of course, it's exaggerated. The U.S. is still quite strong, but still, do you see more uh, possibilities of uh, diverse cultural spaces and an expansion of possibilities? The you know, like not bring like the the lack of you were talking about just going to a a similar uh, hotel, you know, it's all the same, all the design looks like Starbucks and all that stuff. But do you see that receding as globalization changes? Um, I think that globalization is actually here to stay in the following sense. I think that we might see a receding of the entanglement of the economic, uh, you know, security fundamentals of different countries. We might see a receding in the hyper centralization or unified vision of the future. So you might have societies fragmented along different visions of the future. But I think we won't see any reduction in the following things. I don't think we will um, like, how, how should I illustrate this? The European Union might actually politically fall apart. However, the youth of individual European countries have never been more similar in their tastes and their habits of life. Arguably, young Europeans and young Americans are much more similar today in their consumer habits and their lifestyles than they were 40 years ago, right? So Europeans bought more cars, Americans bought fewer cars, uh, you know, Americans started drinking Belgian beer, Europeans started eating more hamburgers. It kind of like mellowed out, evened out, and I think by default, what we're going to see culturally is a somewhat deglobalized world because elite culture will, I think, remain focused on English, but I think the global internet will fragment first along sovereign lines and secondly along um, linguistic lines. I think there'll be an English speaking internet, then there'll be a Russian internet and a Chinese internet. And we'll see what other internets might emerge. But I think those will form kind of these closed social spaces. So one way to think about that is that it's a massive retreat in globalization. But I actually think that, you know, total global cultural diversity will continue to fall. There'll be a few alternative hegemonic cultures, but the total cultural diversity in the world will be smaller and there'll be more long distance integration. So I still think we're actually on a very, very slow, centuries-long globalization trajectory in terms of culture and basically modes of economic production. I have to ask the question, you know, we had this narrative of technological progress where the world used to be developed, uh, you know, divided into the first world and the third world. Then it became divided into the developed world and the developing world. The term developing world implies these countries are going to catch up with the developed countries. I think we're going to have to introduce new terminology because I think a lot of countries are post-industrial in the negative sense. So I think many countries will have economies that will actually recede to the state of development we today call developing. We might then see a world where economically, there's homogenization over time, right? Where living standards in Europe and North America uh, and possibly even some corners of East Asia converge with those in the rest of Asia and Latin America and possibly even the more advanced parts of Africa, not because there has been catch-up growth from everyone. So far, only China has really done impressive, strong catch-up growth, but because there's a decline in living standards in the former first world, right? And this then leads to a world that's perhaps somewhat more economically decentralized, but there's still winners and losers. It's just that they're kind of like rotating at the table. Who's the industrial power of this decade or this, these next few decades? The idea of China one day outsourcing its industrial base and suffering urban blight might seem ludicrous, but it's far from, you know, it's far from an impossibility. We saw the same in Europe, uh, in Britain, right? And we saw it in the United States. And uh, I would not at all be shocked if there's a similar development. Maybe there's something inherently unstable about being a quote unquote developed society. So if there is something inherently in unstable in being a quote unquote developed society, um, that's a very pessimistic view. 
I think in that case, we could see a real receding of globalization, not just like this sort of like small detour, but an actual failure of globalization, right? Cool. Great. Thanks. All right, uh, Daniel, do you want to ask your question about AIs? Sure. So uh, I just had a question about whether or not AIs can discern live players or AIs can become live players. And kind of the background for this is that increasingly as people spend more time on the digital realm and it, as psychographic data becomes more and more fine grained, it becomes harder and harder to actually distinguish what is the root cause of our initial impulse to make a decision in one direction or another. So the whole AI thing is being inbuilt, is inbuilt into the way the players are playing. So I just kind of want to hear you riff on that. I think it might be possible to identify live players using artificial intelligence, right? Because I think a lot of these mass surveillance systems are very good at picking up anomalies. So I think it could detect relatively quickly uh, unusual or anomalous behavior. Now, of course, an anomaly could be, it could be a positive outlier or a negative outlier. So I think if you have something that detects live players and it's automated, an automated system, it's going to read and detect a bunch of the people who are just doing weird things for the sake of being weird. And there's no deeper wisdom there, no deeper advancement. And some of the smaller number of people who are, uh, who are doing, you know, who are doing uh, unusual or exceptional things. Whether AIs can be live players, I think that just requires general intelligence. So that is then rounded off to the question, can artificial intelligence be generally intelligent? So, you know, human, human-like in this sense. I don't see any theoretical reason why it couldn't, but I also see no reason, uh, and so I'm assuming it can. Uh, I think we can have, you know, human-level intelligence, uh, but I see no particular reason to expect it in the very near future. Um, just going off of your definition of a live player mm -hmm. being a person or a group of people that are able to do things that they haven't done before, Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say that there are some AIs that are capable of doing net new things that are currently extant, so not generalized intelligence? I would agree they are. Um, in a narrow sense, this might fit the definition, but doesn't fit the spirit of the definition, if this yeah, makes sure sense. <laughs> because the spirit of the definition is the sort of like adaptation, right? This, this ability to adapt to the novel circumstances in an unforeseen way. And I don't think there's any current narrow AI that can like really adapt in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Peter, would you like to ask your question? All right, Samuel. What kind of questions do live players ask? Well, that's a very good question. Um, but I think that I think the, the question to ask, they ask the kind of questions that allow you to quickly figure out where might lie this unusual or very unexploited or very neglected domain of deep knowledge. So knowledge that actually uh, is not just some explicitly stated theoretical material, but some deep unstated stuff that's you know, in the domain of intellectual dark matter that's either you know, tacit knowledge or it's trade secrets, right? So I think that's one of the things they always pursue. I think they do pursue this type of knowledge. Again, it doesn't have to live in books, right? In fact, it lives very well in individuals. The second type of question life players ask often is, well, how does this system behave? And they probably don't even use the term system, but they will ask questions about how things are done. And they'll ask people who are, you know, uh, very conventional. So they will have a passion for talking to the conventional person and they will have a passion for discerning what life is like for the normal individual or the everyday individual. Uh, and partially because, you know, if you can figure out how these very predictable patterns work in your life player, you can take some really impressive shortcuts. And these are not shortcuts in the sense of cheats. These are ways of achieving the goal that fulfill both the spirit and the letter of the law, but seem like they should be impossible, right? 
and not just in this legal sense, but again, in this moral ethical sense, this like knowledge acquisition sense, this economic sense, any sense you want to think about it, if they observe the normal world closely, if they ask questions to figure out what's happening in the normal world, and they try to see what is the abnormal world, what is the unknown, what is the hidden, what is the unaware, and you can have this very wonderful transfer of one to the other, right? And that is immensely, immensely profitable if I use a different analogy. So spirit or letter of the law is one analogy, profit is another analogy. You could say advantageous, but then all of these words are problematic, right? They already carry, they carry this kind of assumption of either selfishness or selflessness. And I think it's, uh, it's more, let's, let's settle on, can be very advantageous, can be very empowering, right? So they either pursue knowledge or they pursue a certain kind of power. But when I say power, I mean it in this sense that's not necessarily self-centered. They, they, they love shaping the world, right? So all the questions are in service of that. By the way, it's Great. very good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Anjan, would you like to ask your question? Um, sure. Hey, Simon. Um, I really like the article uh, you wrote about YouTube and the knowledge revolution. Um, Thank you. It's been such a big part of my life, and also the examples you gave um, were really memorable for me. Um, but I also, when I traveled, I, I'll never forget this example of seeing like a bunch of like probably 16 year old monks in Burma and like wearing their maroon robes um, on their phone playing like a cooperative like fighting game. Mm -hmm. um, but after they're done the game, they all just watch a shit ton of music videos on YouTube while still in the monastery. And it was like Lil Wayne and Jay-Z and like all that stuff, like Bugattis and nice cars and this. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of what you were saying about the kind of homogenization that happens, what we are, your definition for what globalism will play out. I'm wondering what you think about the role YouTube has to play in that and, um, do you think it? Do you think it ever has a localism inflection point, um, or does it kind of continue this way? Uh, I guess the analogy would be, everybody just had to have their local English teacher, but when all the English teachers are together, everybody can just learn from like the best English teacher in the world. And like, what's the point of just learning from subpar English teachers? Um, if that analogy makes any sense. I think that. YouTube is preponderantly, in this sense, a homogenizing force, but there is a counter force here, which is it creates new niches, right? New niches of knowledge sharing. And I wrote about this in the article because the means through which to record the world, I mean, I think very quickly, these cameras will be more than sufficient for recording even the most high quality YouTube videos, right? Right now, professional YouTubers, uh, they usually still buy purpose-made cameras. But for almost anything, uh, the you know, digital camera on your phone is sufficient, which means that we can now record in fine detail action or practice that a documentary filmmaking team would have never recorded, right? Either for an educational purpose like those 1950s videos or just for entertainment purpose like 1990s Discovery Channel. And this mass of recording of these things in everyday life can preserve many practices in a way that are you know, simply impossible. If I go on YouTube, I'm quite certain I could find a channel, and I've never watched this channel, but I'm sure it exists, on uh, you know, traditional, uh, traditional Korean bow carving. Like I have no reason to think their bows are super interesting, but I bet that there are some hobbyists that shoot bows, and I bet there are hobbyists who have tried to recreate bows as they existed in Korean warfare, and I bet there, there are YouTube videos of how to make those. So in a sense, that cultural tradition is preserved. In another sense, it's divorced from context. Context. It's sort of like uh, European martial arts. Um, we all know, again, East Asian martial arts, but there was a set of European martial arts that mostly went extinct over the last 200 years or 300 years because warfare in Europe changed so dramatically and was so oriented around gunpowder weaponry that all these ways of fighting either with swords or just wrestling in unusual ways were lost. And then recently there's been a community that has revived those practices. But 
this kind of wrestling, like they're not wrestling in taverns to settle disputes, nor are they fighting with swords on the battlefield. So kind of the meaning of that has changed and nothing really prevents you from picking up European martial arts as a hobby in Vietnam or vice versa. Uh, so I think there is homogenization, but hopefully the homogenization preserves some more optionality or variance, right? So I think that that's how I would, I would propose that works. But then I would here also point and push a little bit back uh, because I think YouTube doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't cross borders. It's very easy to have governments decide, okay, no YouTube here. We're only gonna have Russian YouTube or Chinese YouTube or American YouTube or European YouTube. At this point, maybe it sounds silly to propose that the American and European internets might separate one day, but they very easily might. Uh, already with the enhanced privacy rules of Europe, when I go to Europe and try to read the LA Times, the website informs me that they haven't yet figured out how to comply with European privacy laws. So I just don't read it, right? When you see a paywall or this kind of announcement, you don't read it. And you could imagine that there would be also differences in legal environment say the US values free speech more, Europe might value tolerance more. So you might have, in fact, a legal incompatibility of which videos are okay to upload versus not in the two large jurisdictions. Cool. If, if I so may ask a follow-up then. Of well, course. The, the takeaway that comes to mind for me then uh, is there's almost like a strong bifurcation that you can imagine. Like even in the way you're talking about like kind of you get this optionality. It, it seems to me the bifurcation, even with that in YouTube, is those who know how to search and use search, and those who just click on this, the videos that show up on the home screen. Mm -hmm. um, like I notice, I use YouTube. I'm like, like bow carving. I don't know. I see an article, I'll Google it. But my mom, she like never types anything into the search bar on YouTube. She's just always, maybe some time ago in the beginning, she typed one Indian TV show, and then just she just watches whatever recommendations that happen. Well, in an interesting way, that's convergence with television, no? <laughs> television programming, except the programming is customized to you. You're not channel surfing. It's, it's delivered to you on the basis of the information gathered in the past. <laughs> um, I didn't really have more of a point than that because I'm even thinking of the same thing when you're saying like the European internet will, will maybe potentially be different than the American internet. I imagine those with sophistication can mm -hmm. use Telegram or VPNs and so on to get access to all of the above. But, but there'll be but always the a tiny minority. Well, well, yeah. So I'm just wondering if that's a mental model that... Well, the, the most natural comparison here is the Great Firewall of China. Even today in China, it's very trivial to access all internet sites that you want. It's basically a very minor amount of technical sophistication needed. But I remember hearing numbers that about eight to 10% of Chinese citizens ever do this which is like a very small number. You know, that's politically in terms of mass mobilization, that's an irrelevant number. So, so, so if you buy this bifurcation happening, what, what are the implications of it? Cause it's almost too easy for my mind to be like bifurcation bad, but I'm curious. What well, I think it could be very mind. good. I think it could be very good and not intentionally good or designed with good intent, but I think it might result in humanity trying out several different things. And I think it's very useful for us to try and have several cultural modes coexisting, even if they're culturally incompatible. Uh, because I think, you know, if humanity will have issues in the future, it will be because we have not tried enough things, right? Like we won't, we won't have learned the full possibilities. I claim that we do not know the full social possibilities of what the technology of 2020 enables, nor do we know the full possibility of where technology could develop where social circumstance is different, right? And I don't think that there's like a single technological attractor. I think that there are massive contingencies, right? And I base this, you know, this sort of, let's call it an informed guess uh, on the history of technology in our own world, where the printing press in China versus the printing press in Europe have a completely different sociological effect, right? Because the preconditions when that technology enters society are so different. No, Great. Next, next question. Yeah, uh, Key, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hello, Samo. Hello. Um, 
thank you. I, I did come in late. I wanted to acknowledge that first, but um, the question and answers have been really informative, so thank you. And my question is related to when you spoke of singularity earlier. Um, so I just was curious about, well, speaking of what you just spoke about just now, which is trying out um, new things and, and seeing the bifurcation as in a, in a good way, not good intent way, but a, a way for humans to try different things. Question goes to, um, what is your view or stance or even maybe plan on pursuing um, singularity? Well, um, I think that, you know, the intelligence explosion version of the singularity or the Vingian singularity, uh, these are like slightly different concepts, but I'll just learn, I'll roll them together as in the meaning of this transcendence of the human condition, this mass transformation with technology and an explosion of intelligence information in the world, right? I'm, I'm not sure whether singularity as classically conceived is sociologically viable. I feel like there's something strange that happened where I feel like we hit ever stronger social headwinds the closer we came to possibly achieving a rate of progress that would achieve the kind of compounding growth that leads to singularity. Now, I know this is still, this is still a contrarian position. I think the default story is that we're actually still progressing at a decent speed. Uh, but my, my, my claim would be that there's something we don't quite understand about the interrelation between the social structure and intelligence. I think that there's something very counterintuitive there and it's a uh, very much unclear. So assuming it is possible, I would propose that the normal methods of increasing human technological productivity, you know, having the equivalent of conditions where a intellectual golden age is possible, where there are some number of exceptional individuals co-creating, possibly living in one city, possibly traveling between a small number of cities, uh, sharing innovation, inspiring each other, producing on their own steam, not needing much permission from the rest of society, ever more empowered by information technology, that, that is the closest I can come to a sort of singularity scenario. Uh, there's also a world where it's just achieved through the design of like, you know, DeepMind or OpenAI succeed and they build, you know, a super intelligent machine in 2025. And then that's the end of the human era and we don't have to worry about it one way or another. But I think that world for various reasons is fairly unlikely. If I have to bet, and you know, I'm willing to bet because I'm making 50 year plans instead of five year plans with my life and with my intellectual explorations, um, I think that that one that route won't happen. So I think it's something like, you know, maybe the Renaissance uh, plus information technology plus possibly very adaptive learning systems where my phone is you know, both collecting information about me, but I have the ability to use that data uh, and craft software on my own Steam or buy software on my own Steam that's trying to enhance my intelligence rather than take advantage of my predictability, right? So I think even the current state of information technology could be a significant boost to our intelligence, but I do think it takes both the, the human side and the software side. I don't think we can drag humans much more in one direction or another just with software. Though, of course, I admire, you know, attempts like Rome and so on to, to be better note-taking systems. But yeah, hope that answers your question. It does. It really does. Can I ask one follow-up question? Of course. Um, I just wanted to circle back to this um, social structure element that you brought up in the mm -hmm. beginning of the answer. Could you maybe expand a little bit on that and why you think that's a factor for, um, for sort of not betting on <laughs> the, um, the deep mind AI open source type way of um, thinking of the, the future? Mm. Okay. Um, it's not immediately relevant to artificial intelligence, though in some ways it is, where I will propose that Let's examine, you know, 
a, a naive perspective might be the more money you put into artificial intelligence, the faster artificial intelligence progress. So if you went from $10 billion to $500 billion invested in AI, you should have more technological progress. But it's actually fairly easy to possibly construct the opposite scenario, where $500 billion in AI results in lots and lots of software being reclassified as AI projects. There's an argument to be made that this happened to nanotechnology in the 1980s, where there was a firm argument that this might be the future, you know, molecular level machine construction and so on, uh, a concopia of, you know, rapidly expanding material abundance. So there was a lot of government investment into it and resulted in a bunch of interesting in themselves, but boring from the perspective of nanotechnology, material science projects starting to call themselves nanotech. So today there's probably like a nanotechnology department in many technical universities around the world, but the actual amount of nanotechnology done is very low. And some of the people who might have been attracted to the field of nanotechnology can't possibly compete with all these nanotechnology PhDs. And it's a needle in a haystack if you try to fund a real version of it, right? So there's, there's this surprising way in which there are some ways you could envision vastly more resources being spent on scientific progress that doesn't enable it, but chokes it off. Uh, and of course, implicitly, I think this is at least part of the reason why we've had such disappointing returns on investment in technology and science for about 50 years. Cool, next question. We just got like so many good questions in the chat. <laughs> I, I think that's great. This must mean I'm answering them well. If, it, if, if, a, if an answer produces more questions than it answers, that's a great answer. Yes, okay, so um, we have a plus one for Dan's question. Uh, it's about China. Dan, would you like to? ask your question and then uh, we'll see how many more we can get to before the end. Um, I'm not sure it was about China. Um, I think it was on, was it the one that An, Anjan mentioned about the? Uh, yep. Oh, is that, oh, okay, because there was an earlier question I had about Turchin, about Peter Turchin and Clio Dynamics. That one or the, uh, which one? Well, he wanted to hear about China. I know you said so many things in the chat. Well, this, it, what, do, what do people want to hear? What, which question do want to, people want to hear? Well, well, maybe the question can be restated by the plus one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Engine, Whoever gave me the hear? plus one. Uh, yeah, why don't you ask the question and I can clarify. Anjan, you want to? I just want Dan to have his own session next week. <laughs> um. Okay, well, that confuses things even more. Um, all right, let's just go with the. Let's go with the China one then. Okay, so um, one of the, I, I made a comment, and this is what Anjan la latched onto, and it, it was kind of riffing off what you uh, mentioned earlier about tacit, tacit knowledge, and you had stated that uh, um, that it's good that 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 the different blocks that there's going to be there's not going to be a clear hegemon we're going to have china and we're going to have europe or we're going to have north america this sort of thing and that um different political economic experiments and technologies will be developed and legal systems and so on and so forth will be developed in these different areas and then you mentioned something earlier about tacit knowledge and i and I agree that it's good if these different um, regions start developing their own things. And I lived in China for 10 years, so I'm aware. I lived on both sides of the Great Firewall, and I experienced the difficulty of living on both sides of, of the Great Firewall, as well it, as the it, it's, cer it's certainly inconvenient, but I do think the point about it not being that difficult to avoid uh, stands, because I've talked to, to others who've lived in China. And, you well, can get around. Yeah, yeah, you have a VPN and easily you can get around it. Um, it can be a hassle at times. But my, my point is that most, most Chinese people, for example, are not fluent in English. Yes. And that's kind of the, the, the language, the language barrier. barrier. The is, language is... barrier. And there's not only a language barrier, there's a huge culture barrier. And this gets to the, your point about the tacit knowledge. There's even a big culture barrier between Europe and, and kind of the neoliberal libertarian capitalist 
American capitalists as well. So um, my point is, I think it's great that these different experiments are happening, mm -hmm. but there's an ins I would argue that there's an insufficient number of people that are bicultural or bilingual, sorry, um, to take advantage of these different experiments. So we have these wonderful experiments that are going on in the world, but the, the different parts of the world can't really take advantage of them because an insufficient number of people um, in each culture is kind of a dual citizen or a dual, you know, bicultural to, to bring that into the culture. And they bifurcated or trifurcated to such a degree and we're so polarized that there's also that that comes into play as well. So I was wondering if you- I think this is, this is very much true in the sense that it's true that we benefit massively from more people that can in fact be bicultural, that not only cross a language barrier, but as you noted, this much more fundamental cultural barrier. Like I guarantee you, there is a culture shock for anyone that moves from New York to San Francisco or from San Francisco to New York. It's subtle. They don't want to call it a culture shock, but it is a culture shock and you go through the list of like you know the symptoms of culture shock which are sometimes physiological symptoms you might have a fever for example um they experience it and of course they always complain about leaving new york right so there's that they are somehow aware that they have been molded by one city and even though we all speak you know all speak english a lot of us are immigrants uh, most people are american citizens it's so different so everything said there extends also to Britain, extends to Germany, so within the Western world, and let alone Japan, which is economically integrated, but culturally not integrated at all. And in fact, Japan also has a language barrier, and people might not realize that actually English fluency is not that good in, in Japan. And of course, Japanese fluency is non-existent in the United States. This leads me to say something rather interesting, right? It, Imagine that these are sort of seeds we've planted. Well, we don't have to, we don't have to immediately harness all of them, right? There's a bifurcation or trifurcation or fragmentation of the world, but often people learn the most or are most inspired by civilizations that reach the end stage of their existence. Uh, it is Byzantine scholars fleeing the Byzantine empire and, you know, Arab scholars you know, teaching in Cordoba in Spain that sort of bring the Renaissance to Europe. This transition of ancient Greek knowledge significantly relies on the end of the Byzantine world. And I would also argue that the advances in artificial intelligence that we did see in the United States were the result of Soviet emigres from the 1990s. How many places that have top quality engineers and scientists and mathematicians who would have had the Berlin Wall never fallen been uh, Soviet mathematicians and so on. There's also like a deeper intellectual legacy with the prehistory of artificial intelligence that I won't go into. Um, and then I can give another example. You know, this is a possibly, you know, obviously, you know, Nazi Germany was this terrible, terrible country, terrible regime. However, America's rocket science comes from there. And it was Operation Paperclip that, been, that brings Werner von Braun and the other rocket scientists to the United States and enables the space program. So often when a societal experiment, either successful or unsuccessful, is essentially over or starts falling apart, the fragments of it or the refugees of it will be extremely productive in a new culture, if only there's anywhere at all to go. Uh, in fact, I can give you a more interesting analogy where arguably the German world had two stages of collapse. First is the rise of the Nazis, causes a lot of the intellectually most productive people to flee for the United States. And then the fall of the Nazis causes the few remaining intellectually productive people to flee. And this is why Germany is like perhaps good at industry, but is not the intellectual frontier anymore. And it just was the intellectual frontier for about a hundred years from about 1830 onwards to about 1930. Cool, next, next question. Can we do like, two more questions. I know it's at the hour. But Perfect. Great. Okay. So Tyson, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Thank you. Okay. So my question. Yes. Uh, so have cities reached a point of diminishing returns as far as their ability to extract innovation and productivity 
from people? And will significant amounts of people move away from cities into rural areas to pursue a new way of living? And if so, do um, you think it's likely there will be major efforts from the elites to resist or slow this shift in this migration? And then if so, um, like maybe any thoughts about what to do about that or just, how, yeah, how you think about that? It's a very good question. I hope the answer is no, because if the answer is yes, I just believe this means that, you know, American civilization has entered terminal decline. I can't think of a single de-urbanization in the last 10,000 years. And note, cities are deeply problematic objects, right? Cities are often death traps. They're often places of misery. Uh, they're often places of violence and instability. But I can't think of a single case where de-urbanization happened. I can think of many cases where there is an expansion, where there's a large rural population where previously there was just a hunter-gatherer population, right? Say, you know, colonizing of the Americas, right? But this, this isn't the, the end of cities or the cities being outcompeted. Uh, usually it's the case that cities monopolize the best opportunities for themselves. So if we are seeing mass de-urbanization in the US, I don't think this is due to like, you know, there being such amazing opportunities in the countryside. It's because the cities themselves, even after having hogged all the best opportunities in society, don't have much to offer. So it's sort of like growth has been completely choked off. It's not just zero sum games because zero sum games can maintain cities, I think, at least for a while. It's negative sum games. So people flee, right? The only winning move, if the only winning move for the game of society is not to play, that's the situation where you see de-urbanization. And if the only winning move is not to play, well, then eventually there'll be a bank run. So I hope that's not the case. And I also think that there'll be de-urbanization of some American cities. For example, I would not be surprised if Chicago eventually converges with uh, other hollowed out uh, Great Lake cities such as Detroit. And I would not be surprised if New York significantly stagnates, but I don't think its population is going to go down. Uh, I also would not be that surprised if you see a complete failure of either San Francisco or Seattle. Though again, I think the primary, the primary prediction I would make, the likeliest Bayesian you know, evidence seems to be in the outcome of a stable San Francisco and a growing and technologically innovative Seattle. Though the San, Fr San Francisco is kind of like a finance center, I think it becomes the finance center of the West Coast, uh, including with its own stock exchange as uh, there's a new one being set up and with various financial instruments that will be distant uh, legal descendants of the venture capital industry. Cool. Great, and our final question uh, from a medic caper. Hey, um, so I have a thought that a uh, language might naturally decay and lose its semantic meaning. Um, so it would move from expressive and sacred uh, to instrumental and profane. Um, I, think, I think this problem is solved in pre-modern societies through ritual is one, one way. Um, mm -hmm. it, can, it can also be violence, but in modern societies we've kind of tried to replace all that with, uh, with growth, like economic growth or technological innovation. Um, and I was, I was wondering if you think uh, this is, I guess, sufficient to, uh, to reify language. Because if, if, if you have um, no, if there's no like hooks for language to dig into in reality, mm -hmm. it just starts sliding around. If you get people, um, you know, you talk about scripts, right? People are repeating scripts to get what they, they want, but the scripts are, they're meaningless. They're, uh, they're interchangeable, right? Well, y yes, um, the scripts are interchangeable. But just because, you know, I think, I think behaviorism is, is, a relatively is a relatively negative way of viewing the human condition, but something along the lines of, well, does the flight of a bird have meaning? So a lot of these scripts are meaningless, but adaptive, if this makes sense. And they do differ to each other, from each other in, in their adaptivity. Yeah, well, there, there is a, like a physical layer of, uh 
objective reality, which, uh, you know, you, that's a problem you can run into. I mean, yeah, so either, either you reify language through some kind of ritual or you just get into serious shit and then, and then you have to manage it, right? Well, I think, I think language has a wonderful ability to reinvent itself where basically subcultural groups might actually have higher information density language right now than mainstream society because the subculture uses stuff that's not visible or uh, intelligible to the outside to communicate highly contextual information. Meanwhile, say, I think, for example, like if you could in information theory measure the amount of information that is conveyed through the course of a normal political debate or through the course of a brief conversation on Wall Street today. I'm not sure a lot of information is exchanged. I think a lot of very complex verbal behavior happens, but I think very little information is passed through. And if I look at some Twitter subcultures, I see immense amounts of information passed through, you know, the 280 characters available. So I sort of am optimistic in the sense that meaning can be rescued if only by retreating to the esoteric or retreating to the Straussian or retreating to the sub rosa layer. Cool. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying meaning is, uh, it's hopeless. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, uh, are we sort of at a lack for, for means of, um, of ensuring this connection between language and meaning? Like, is there- Oh, is, yes, is, is, yes, no, no question about it. Language okay, right yeah. now, and communication and the epistemic commons are really compromised. And I applaud any and all efforts to improve the, the epistemic commons and the communication commons. It's just deeply necessary infrastructure for our society. Okay, thank you for your question. Was that, was that the last one? That was the last one. And thank you so much for staying a little bit over to answer all these great questions. Perfect. Great. Thank you for so, having me. Of course, thank you so much. And we'll see you again next week. And I will just do a little bit of a upregulating of some of the events that we have coming up tomorrow. At the Wisdom Gym, we have the Psychotechnology Playground with Benita Roy at 10 a.m. We have Collective Presencing with Rhea Beck at noon. And we have Socratic Speed Dating with yours truly, Raven Connolly, at 7 p.m. Uh, you can register at the stoa.ca. We also have the recurring sense making series, The Dark Stoa, with Pat Ryan tomorrow at 8 30. Uh, I think that this is the last of the first season, so don't miss that one. And then for a uh, one off session, we have Who's Sensing the Sense Makers with Brent Cooper. Brent Cooper is a vocal critic of the sense making web, and he's coming to address this important question. So that will be at 5.30 Eastern time. Hope to see you all there. And if you would like to give the STOA a gift, you can visit us at the stoa.ca slash gift. And thank you all so much. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Samo. Yeah, bye everyone.